Grace, peace, and mercy are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. As Jesus neared the end of his public ministry, he knew that his time of of suffering, his time of death was drawing close. And so he started to make more and more clear that the kingdom over which he was a king, the kingdom over which he ruled, was going to be unlike any other kingdom this world has ever known. That his kingdom was an upside-down kingdom of of grace and mercy and love and peace where the the poor were rich, the, the weak were strong, where the sinful were declared righteous. Today we're looking at Matthew 20 for our gospel text. In the chapter leading up to this, in all of chapter 19, this is what Jesus is doing. He points to little children. He says it's, it's these ones, not the, the Pharisees, not the scribes who look so holy and righteous. It's these ones, the, the, the humble ones who hearts, whose hearts are full of faith. This is to whom the kingdom of heaven belongs. He taught in his kingdom that wealth was not a sign of God's favor. That's what everybody assumed. If you're poor, it's your fault because you did something wrong, and so that's why you're in a, in a rough spot. But if you were rich, that means that you're righteous because wealth is a sign of God's favor. It's a sign that you have done the right thing, you've lived the right way, and that is a reward for your holy way of living. And in chapter 19, Jesus says it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter heaven. He concludes by saying, many who are first will be last and the last first. And so it's following all of this that we hear the parable in our text for this morning. Jesus here is explaining more about what he means by this, that the last will be first, the first will be last, that everything in the kingdom of heaven is is an upside-down kingdom, that it's not as we would expect, that our ideas of of what is right, our ideas of what we have earned, our ideas of, of who gets rewarded, our ideas of what is fair are not in alignment with with what is true in the kingdom of heaven. Let's read our parable here from our gospel in Matthew chapter 20, starting with the very first verse. I invite you to please rise for the reading of the gospel. Indeed, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. After agreeing to pay the workers a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. He also went out about the third hour and saw others standing unemployed in the marketplace. To these he said, you also go into the vineyard, and I will give you whatever is right. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did the same thing. When he went out about the eleventh hour, he found others standing unemployed. He said to them, Why have you stood here all day unemployed? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He told them, you also go into the vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group and ending with the first. When those who were hired around the eleventh hour came, they each received a denarius. When those who were hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but they each received a denarius too. After they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were last worked one hour, and you made them equal to us who have endured the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he answered one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not make an agreement with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. I want to give to the last one hired the same as I also gave to you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? In the same way, the last will be first, and the first last. Dear Heavenly Father, these words are yours, and so we know that they are the truth. We ask that you would increase our faith through them. Amen. You may be seated. We all on some innate level recognize fairness. It's something that we crave. It's something that we we fight for. And more than recognizing when it's there, it's easy to recognize when something is not fair. But what makes this difficult is that we disagree on what is fair. Uh, One person said that fairness is like beauty. It's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, So if fairness is not an objective thing, if it's subjective, if it's based on on who's involved in their roles and their their personalities, 
then, then it's a lot harder to come to a conclusion on what's fair. There's one piece of pie left at home and both of my sons want some pie. Is it more fair for me to cut a, a bigger piece from my older son since he's older and, and he eats more, he's a bigger kid? My older son would say, absolutely, that's fair, 100%. My younger son would say, no way, cut that thing right down the middle, right? We like fairness because it gives us some assurance, right? It's evidence, it gives evidence of, of order and, and predictability. It tells me that if I put in the work, if I do enough, that I'm going to receive what I am due. I'm going to receive what's fair, what I deserve. This desire for fairness is in so many aspects of our, of our society, of our culture here in the United States as well, and, and held up in high regard. Right? You have a right to a fair trial. Uh, we all want criminals to suffer a fair punishment for the, the crimes that they have committed. Uh, we understand that, that in the United States that we want to offer everybody, no matter their, their culture, background, uh, where they were born, whatever it is, uh, fair opportunities for success. When it comes to us personally, we want, we want fair payment for our work and, and what we produce. But when it comes to the kingdom of God, fairness is not a priority. And maybe that strikes us as, as, as strange or, or, or weird because we see fairness as, as the morally right thing to be, right? Fair, being fair is, is good. And absolutely, in our life, we should strive to be fair whenever we can. But God's priority as he deals with us, as he interacts with us individually, is not fairness. God's priority is love. And in this parable, Jesus is teaching us that fairness and grace, they're opposed to each other. You can't have fairness and grace at the same time. There is no such thing as fair grace. When we talk about grace, we know that this is a, a, a hallmark, one of the, the main characteristics of the Christian faith and of the Word of God, and it flips everything upside down. The world says the last are last and the first are first. Right? The last are last because they're the worst. They, they, they cross the line last. They deserve the least. Uh, they, they didn't try hard. Whatever it is, they're last, and so they're last. Grace doesn't care. Like grace doesn't care what you look like. It doesn't care what you've done. It doesn't care where you've come from. It doesn't care how much you've produced. It doesn't care how talented you are, how attractive you are. It doesn't care how often you fail. Grace says God loves you anyway. God's love is for you no matter what. No matter what your makeup, no matter what your history, God's love is for you. We often define grace very simply. We say that it's undeserved love, right? And as we, as we talk about this undeserved love, we rightly emphasize that, that love, the second part of it. This is God's love for you. But we can't forget that first part too, right? That it is undeserved. That means that it is not fair that we get it. We have not done anything that makes us lovable. We have not done anything that, that makes us so that we are, are more attractive for God to give to us his forgiveness and his mercy. Each and every single one of us is sinful in our, our nature and our actions. And so God has held up the standard and we have fallen short not just by doing the wrong thing, but by who we are, by our very nature. When it comes to our relationship with God, what would be fair? The wages of sin is death, right? That's what fairness is as we think about our relationship with God and our, our, eternal, our eternal outcome. What would be fair is if God looked at us and said, I have, I have told you what I demand. I demand perfection. I demand righteousness. You don't have it, so you don't get to go to heaven. Instead, I'm going to put you in hell forever. But this is why we celebrate the unfairness of God because he doesn't do this. He doesn't treat us according to what is fair. He treats us according to what is loving. In that love, God did the most unfair thing imaginable. Right? He sent His one and only Son, His righteous, holy, innocent Son, to suffer and die in our place. He sent Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And Jesus did it. He, he never failed. And then in the most unfair way imaginable, he goes to the cross and he suffers the punishment that we deserve so that we can receive the victory that he himself earned. 
Grace is not fair. That's not God's focus. His focus is His all-encompassing love and His desire for us to be with Him. And not just united with Him in this life, but united with Him forever in heaven. So we're grateful for God's unfairness, aren't we? We say, thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your undeserved, unfair love for me. We're grateful for God's unfairness as long as we're on the good side of it. And this parable that we just read, it's about God's grace. And the most direct way to apply this to our lives is by looking at death. My great-grandma, she died at 102 years old, and she was a, a faithful Christian woman her entire life. Right, you can see the, the heritage of her faith passed down to her daughter, my grandma, to my dad, to my children. Right? You look at her, you say, yes, this is a wonderful Christian woman. Now compare her to a, a, a murderous, thieving criminal who, who is about to be put to death for his crimes. And, and in the fear of, of death, turns to God's word for help. And, and the Holy Spirit grants him to, to the, the, the faith to believe what he is reading. He receives the same victory, the same crown of righteousness that my great-grandmother received. Is that fair? This is the question that's asked by the parable. Right, some work all day long in this vineyard. 12 hours in the scorching heat. Another group works for one hour. And yet they receive the same amount of money. The, the owner comes and brings them all forward and he's careful to pay the last person first. Right? The person only works an hour. He receives a denarius, which is equal to a full day's pay. And so the people who've been working for 12 hours have dollar signs in their eyes thinking, man, if he's that generous with somebody who worked for one hour, how much are we going to get? They get the same exact thing. They get a day's wage, exactly what they agreed to, to, to receive. The vineyard owner, owner says, take what is yours and go. I want to give the last one hired the same as I also gave to you. Can't I do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So is what the vineyard owner did, is this fair? And when it comes to my, my great-grandma and this, this thieving, murderous criminal, is that fair? The, the answer is no. Right? Not at all. It's not fair that they both receive the crown of righteousness, that they both receive eternal life in heaven, because neither one of them deserved it. They are both recipients of God's all-encompassing love and mercy and forgiveness, a gift that neither one earned or deserved in any way. That's what we as God's people need to remember, that, that none of us deserve this. God's grace is never fair, and we should never be envious that he's generous with his love, with his forgiveness, since he's poured it out on us too. Why, we, we, we live with the confidence and the joy of knowing that we are going to heaven. So we would, should never be envious that somebody else lives with the same joy and confidence that they too are going to heaven. This becomes a problem for us, though, when we forget what it is that is actually fair. Since, since fairness is built into us, since it, it is innate, we naturally lean towards believing, I'm better, so I deserve better. I want rewards for being good. My grandma was a good person, and, and so she deserves more good things. But God's grace is unfair no matter who receives it, no matter who it's given to, since none of us deserve it. And I think that brings us to maybe a more relevant example for our lives today, since I have not known anyone personally who was converted on their deathbed that I would consider to be a, a terrible person. And, and it, it seems kind of like a, a, a niche situation to say that I'm envious of another person's salvation. But this attitude still hits us as, as a big temptation at times in our lives, and, and this is how. We want God to be fair, not just in our death, but in our life. Right? I want God to be fair, not just when I close my eyes and go to heaven, but right now as I'm living today in the city of Mankato. On some level, deep down inside of me, since I'm uh, sin sinful by nature, since that sinfulness still lurks inside of me, there's a piece of me that believes, well, since I am a good Christian, since I'm a pastor even, since I've devoted my life to the preaching and teaching of God's word, I deserve for my life to be easier than other people. I deserve less difficulty, less hardship. I deserve a, a little bit more reward since I'm generally a good person. And I think that, that we all feel that on some level. 
And maybe not when everything is going well, but in those seasons of our life where everything is going wrong, where, where hardship is stacked on top of difficulty, on top of tragedy, where, where bad thing happens after bad thing, where, where it's just endless amounts of, of, of hardship. And then we look at, at those evil people out there who are living in luxury and, and seem to have no problems in their life, and we go, Lord, what are you doing? Don't, don't you know that I'm one of the good guys? Don't you know that I'm working for you down here? I have faith in you. I'm one of your children. This isn't fair. Why am I not getting what I deserve? Why is my life not easier? Why do I have so many difficulties? Why are there so many hardships in my path? I think it's in these moments that we need this parable even more. That we need to look at this parable and be reminded that God never deals with us according to what is fair, but according to what is most loving. And his divine love, as he sees all and knows all, and knows you more, more intimately and fully than you even know yourself, remember that God gives you not fairness, but love. And in that love, the difficulties that we face are different. Right? And they're, they're not fair. But God promises us that, that they are the most loving thing and that he's going to work them to our good to a, a, a make us have a closer relationship with him increase our trust in him encourage us and show us that he is the one who provides everything that we need and so the challenges and the struggles that i have needed to endure in my life the challenges and struggles that that are in my future are different than the ones that that you have faced and will face because god is using these things in his love to shape us and mold us for the unique tasks that he has prepared in advance for us to do. God is, is making us holy. He's sanctifying us through his word as we experience these hardships and are driven to his word and we're reminded of his promises and see those things come true in our life. As we, as we turn to his word for comfort instead of this world that can't provide it. He's shaping us and molding us to serve in love the way that he needs us to serve in love. And he knows what we each need specifically and individually to be reminded that we don't deserve anything. That the stuff in our life that we consider good, we don't deserve it. We have not earned it. It's not because of the labor of our hands. It's not because we're good people. We do not deserve it. He gives us challenges and hardships to knock us on our knees to remind us that we need to turn to him in repentance and be reminded that every good thing is a sign of his grace, his undeserved love, a gift from him. To be reminded that there, are no, there is no evil people over there. That is each and every single one of us, that we all have fallen, fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sinned. Learn to live in and love the unfairness of life, the unfairness of the kingdom of God. We've received something that we have no business possessing. Why right? We have received the gift of eternal life. Because of what Jesus did for us, because of his sacrifice, our sins are completely removed from us. And we, we, we know that we are going to heaven. We don't deserve to, to live with the joy that we have. Right? We have no business walking around with the confidence that we have of knowing that since Jesus died on the cross, I get to go to heaven to be with my God forever in the paradise that he has prepared for me. And what's so awesome about this gift, this, this gift of the gospel, this gift of the good news of what Jesus has done for us is that it's not like a piece of pie. Right? The more that I share, it doesn't mean that I get less. The more that I share the good news that, that, that I have joy and confidence because of what my Savior has done for me, it doesn't mean I get less joy. It doesn't mean I get less heaven. As we share that good news, it just make, means that there's a, a good opportunity that that person, that that joy can be multiplied in that person as well. God's love is unfair. There's no two ways around it. Don't lament it. Celebrate it. Knowing that it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. Amen.